Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer, where we last left off in Stuart Little. Stuart began looking for his friend Margolo, the bird, and, while he was traveling, took up the role of a substitute teacher in a small schoolhouse. Now we're continuing his travels to see if he can find Margolo. What adventure awaits him then? We shall find out in the last three chapters. So you ready? All right. Let's begin. Chapter 13. Amy's Crossing. In the loveliest town of all, where the houses were white and high, and the elm trees were green and higher than the houses, where the front yards were wide and pleasant, and the backyards were bushy and worth finding out about, where the streets sloped down to the stream, and the stream flowed quietly under the bridge, where the lawns ended in orchards, and the orchards ended in fields, and the fields ended in pastures, and the pastures climbed the hill and disappeared over the top towards the wonderful wide sky. In the loveliest of all towns, Stuart stopped to get a drink of Sarsa Parilla. Whatever that is. Parking his car in front of the general store, he stepped out, and the sun felt so good that he sat down on the porch for a few moments to enjoy the feeling of being in a new place on a fine day. This was the most peaceful and beautiful spot he had found in all his travels. It seemed to him a place he would gladly spend the rest of his life in, if it weren't that he, for the fact that he might get homesick for the sights of New York City and for his family, Mr. and Mrs. Frederick C. Little and George, and if it weren't for the fact that something deep inside him made him want to find Margolo, he'll be back. I'm sure he'll find her. Ahem. <clears throat> After a while, the storekeeper came out to smoke a cigarette, and he joined Stuart on the front steps. He started to offer Stuart a cigarette, but when he noticed how small he was, he changed his mind. Have you any sarsaparilla in your store? asked Stuart. I've got a ruinous thirst. Whatever that means. Certainly, said the storekeeper. Gallons of it. Sarsaparilla, root beer, birch beer, ginger ale, moxie, lemon soda, coca-cola, pepsi-cola... Dipsy Cola, Pipsy Cola, Popsy Cola. Those aren't real sodas. And raspberry cream tonic. Anything you want. Uh, let me have a bottle of sarsaparilla, please, said Stuart. And a paper cup. Storekeeper went back into the store and returned with the drink. He opened the bottle, poured uh, some out into the cup, and set the cup down on the step below Stuart, who whipped off his cap, lay down on his stomach, and dipped some up some of the cool, refreshing drink, using his cap as a dipper. Hmm, pretty clever. <clears throat> That's very refreshing, remarked Stuart. There's nothing like a long, cool drink in the heat of the day when you're traveling. Are you going far? asked the storekeeper. Perhaps very far, replied Stuart. I'm looking for a bird named Margolo. You haven't sighted her, have you? No, can't say that I have, said the storekeeper. Uh, what does she look like? Perfectly beautiful, replied Stuart, wiping the sarsaparilla off his lips with the corner of his sleeve. She's a remarkable bird. Anybody would notice her. She comes from a place where there are thistles. The storekeeper looked at Stuart closely. How tall are you, he asked. You mean in my stocking feet, As said Stuart. Yes. T two in inches and a quarter, answered Stuart. I haven't been measured recently, however. I may have shot up a bit. You know, said the storekeeper thoughtfully, there's somebody in this town you really ought to meet. Uh, who's that? asked Stuart, yawning. Harriet Ames, said the storekeeper. She's just your size. Maybe a trifle shorter, if anything. What she liked? asked Stuart. Fair, fat, and forty? <laughs> no, Harriet is young, and she is quite pretty. She's considered one of the best-dressed girls in this town, too. All her clothes are tailored, especially for her. Not so, remarked Stuart. Yes. Harriet's quite a girl. Her people, the ain't zees are rather prominent in this town. One of her ancestors used to be the ferryman here in the days of the American Revolution. He would care. He would. <coughs> he would carry anybody across the stream. He didn't care whether they were British soldiers or American soldiers, as long as they paid their fare. Seems like a reasonable gentleman. <laughs> I guess he did pretty well. Anyway, the Ameses have always had plenty of money. They live in a big house with a lot of servants. I know Harry would be very much interested to meet you. That's very kind of you, replied Stuart, but I'm not much 
of a society man these days. Too much on the move. I never stay long anywhere. I blow into a town and blow right out again. Here today, gone tomorrow, a will of the wisp. The highways and byways are where you'll find me, always looking for Margalow. Sometimes I feel that I'm quite near to her and that she's just around the turn of the road. Other times I feel that I'll never find her and never hear her voice again. Which reminds me, it's time I was on my way. Stuart paid for his drink, said goodbye to the storekeeper, and drove off. But Ames Crossing seemed like the finest town he had ever known, and before he reached the end of the main street, he swerved sharp left, turned off onto a dirt road, and drove down to a quiet spot on the bank of the river. That afternoon he swam and lay on his back in the mo on the mossy bank, his hands crossed under his head, his thoughts returning to the conversation he had had with the storekeeper. Harriet Ames, he murmured. Evening came, and Stuart still lingered by the stream. He ate a light slupper, supper of a cheese sandwich and a drink of water, and slept that night in the warm grass with the sound of the stream in his ears. In the morning, as the sun rose warm and bright, and Stuart slipped into the river again for an early dip. After breakfast, he left his car hidden under a skunk cabbage leaf, and walked up to the post office. While he was filling his fountain pen from the public inkwell, he happened to glance towards the door, and what he saw startled him so... Oh, that he, he almost lost his balance and fell into the ink. A girl about two inches high had entered and was crossing the floor towards the mailboxes. She wore sports clothes and walked in with her head held high. In her hair was a stamen from a flower. Stuart began to tremble from excitement. Must be the Ames girl, he said to himself and he kept out of sight behind the inkwell as he watched her open the mailbox, which was about a quarter of an inch wide, and pull out her letters. The storekeeper had told the truth. Harriet was pretty. And, of course, she was the only girl Stuart had ever encountered who wasn't miles and miles taller than he was. Stuart figured that if the two of them were to walk along together, her head would come a little higher than his shoulder. The idea filled him with interest. He wanted to slide down the door to the, door, to the floor and speak to her, but he didn't dare. All his boldness had left him, and he stayed hidden behind the inkwell until Harriet had gone. When he was sure that she was out of sight, he stole out of the post off. He strolled out out of the post office and slunk down the street to the store, half hoping that he would meet the beautiful little girl, half fearing that he would. Have you any engraved stationery? he asked the storekeeper. I'm behind up my correspondence. The storekeeper helped Stuart up onto the letter and found some letter paper for him. Small paper marked with the initial L. Stuart whipped out his fountain pen, sat down against a five-cent candy bar, and began a letter to Harriet. My dear Miss Ames, he wrote, I am a young person of modest proportions. By birth, I am a New Yorker. But at the moment, I am traveling on business of a confidential nature. My travels have brought me to your village. Yesterday, the storekeeper of your local store, who has an honest face and an open manner, gave me a most favorable report of your character and appearance. At this point in the letter, Stuart's pen ran dry from the long words, and Stuart had to get the storekeeper to lower him head first into a bottle of ink so that he could refill it, the pen. Then he went back to ri letter writing. Pray forgive me, Miss Ames, continued Stuart, for presuming to strike up an acquaintance on so slender an excuse as your physical similarity, but of course the fact is, as you yourself must know, there are very few people who are only two inches in height. I say two inches. Actually, I am somewhat taller than that. My only drawback is that I look something like a mouse. I am nicely proportioned, however, and am also muscular beyond my years. Let me be perfectly blunt. My purpose in writing this brief note is to suggest that we meet. I realize that your parents may object to the suddenness and directness of my proposal, as well as to my somewhat mouse-like appearance, so I think probably it might be a good idea if you just didn't mention the matter to them. What they don't know won't hurt them. However, you probably understand more about dealing with your father and mother than I do, so I won't attempt to instruct you, but will leave everything to your good judgment. 
Being an outdoors person, I am camped by the river in an attractive spot at the foot of Tracy's Lane. Would you care to go for a paddle with me in my canoe? About, about tomorrow afternoon towards sundown, when the petty annoyances of the day are behind us and the river seems to flow more quietly in the long shadows of the willows. These tranquil spring evenings are designed by special architects for the enjoyment of boatmen. I love the water, dear Miss Ames, and my canoe is like an old and trusted friend. Stuart forgot in the excitement of writing to Harriet that he did not own a canoe. If you wish to accept my invitation, be at the river tomorrow at about five o'clock. I shall await your arrival with all the eagerness I can muster, and now I must close this offensive letter and catch up with my affairs. Yours very truly, Stuart Little. Very formal letter. After Stuart had sealed his letter in an envelope, he turned to the storekeeper. Where can I get hold of a canoe, he asked. Right here, replied the storekeeper. He walked over to his souvenir counter and took down a little birchmark canoe with the words Summer Memory stamped on the side. Stuart examined it closely. Does he, she leak? asked Stuart. It's a nice canoe, replied the storekeeper, bending it gently back into shape with his fingers. It'll cost you 75 cents plus a penny tax. Stuart took out his money and paid the man. Then he looked inside the canoe and noticed that there were no paddles. Uh, what about paddles? he said, making his voice sound businesslike. The storekeeper hunted around among the souvenirs, but he couldn't seem to find any paddles, so he went over to the ice cream counter and came back with two little cardboard spoons, the kind you use for eating ice cream on picnics. These will work out all right as paddles, he said. Stuart took the spoons, but he was disgusted with the looks of them. They may work out all right, said Stuart, but I would hate to meet an American Indian while I had one of these things in my hand. The storekeeper carried the canoe and the paddles out in the front of the store and set them down in the street. He wondered that this tiny boatman, what this tiny boatman would do next, but Stuart never hesitated. Taking a piece of thread from his pocket, he lashed the paddles to the thwarts, swung the canoe lightly up on his head, and walked off with it as calmly as though he were a Canadian guide. He was very proud of his ability with boats, and he liked to show off. Hmm. I'm sure he did. Chapter 14. An Evening on the River. When Stuart arrived at his campsite by the river, he was tired and hot. He put the canoe in the water and was sorry to see that it leaked badly. The birch bark at the stern was held together by a lacing, and the water came in through the seam. In a f very few seconds, the canoe was half full of water. Darn it, said Stuart, I've been swindled. He had paid 76 cents for a genuine Indian birch bark canoe, only to find that it leaked. 76 cents in 1945. How much is that now? <laughs> darn, 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 he muttered. Then he bailed out his canoe and hauled it up on the beach for repairs. He knew he couldn't take Harriet out in a leaky boat. She wouldn't like it. Tired though he was, he climbed a spruce tree and found some spruce gum. With this, he plugged the seam and stopped the leak. Even so, the canoe turned out to be a cranky little craft. If Stuart had not had plenty of experience on the water, he would have gotten into serious trouble with it. It was a tippy boat, even for a souvenir. Stuart carried stones from the beach down on the water's edge and ballasted the canoe with the stones until it floated evenly and steadily. He made a backrest so that Harriet would be able to lean back and trail her fingers in the water if she wished. He also made a pillow by tying one of his clean handkerchiefs around some moss. Then he went for a paddle to practice his boat stroke. He was angry that he didn't have anything better than a paper spoon for a paddle, but he decided there, there was nothing he could do about it. He wondered whether Harriet would notice that this paddle was really just an ice cream spoon. If she does, she probably wouldn't care. That is, if she's a modest person. All that afternoon, Stuart worked on the canoe, adjusting the ballast, filling the seams, and getting everything shipshape for the tomorrow. He could think of nothing else but his date with Harriet. At supper time, he took his axe, felled a dandelion, opened a can of deviled ham, ugh, and had a light supper of ham and dandelion milk. I didn't know dandelions had liquid in them. After supper, he propped himself up against a fern, bit off some spruce gum for a chew, and lay there on the bank dreaming and chewing gum. In his imagination, he went over every detail of tomorrow's trip with Harriet. With his eyes shut, he seemed to see the whole occasion plainly. How sh 
He would look when she came down the path to the water, how calm and peaceful the river was going to be in the twilight, how graceful the canoe would seem drawn up on the shore. In imagination, he lived every minute of their evening together. They would paddle to a large water lily pad upstream, and he would invite Harriet to step out on the pad and sit a while. Stuart planned to wear his swimming trunks under his clothes so that he would dive off a lily pad into the cool stream. He would swim the cruel stroke up and down and all around the lily pad, while Harriet watched, admiring his ability as a swimmer. Stuart chewed the spruce gum very rapidly as he thought about this part of the episode. Suddenly, Stuart opened his eyes and sat up. He thought about the letter he had sent, and he wondered whether it had ever been delivered. It was an unusually small letter, of course, and might have gone unnoticed in the letterbox. This idea filled him with fears and worries. But soon he let his thoughts return to the river, and as he lay there, a whip poor will began to sing on the opposite shore. Darkness spread over the land, and Stuart dropped off to sleep. The next day dawned cloudy. Stuart had to go up to the village to have the oil changed in his car. So he hid the canoe under some leaves, tied it firmly to a stone, and went off on his errand, still thinking about Harriet and wishing it were a nicer day. The sky looked rainy. Stuart returned from the village with a headache, but he hoped that it would be, be, be better before five o'clock. He felt rather nervous, as he had never taken a girl canoeing before. He spent the afternoon lying around camp, tying on different shirts, trying on different shirts to see which looked best on him, and combing his whiskers. He would no sooner get a clean shirt than on than he would discover that it was wet under the arms from nervous perspiration, and as he would have to change it for a dry tone. He put on a clean shirt at two o'clock, another at three o'clock, and another a quarter, a quarter past four. This took up most of the afternoon. As five o'clock drew near, Stuart grew more and more nervous. He kept looking at his watch, glancing up the path, combing his hair, talking to himself, and fidgeting. The day had turned chilly, and Stuart was almost sure that there was go going to be rain. He couldn't imagine what he would do if it should rain just as Harriet Ames showed up to go canoeing. At last five o'clock arrived. Stuart heard someone coming down the path. It was Harriet. She had accepted his invitation. Stuart threw himself down against a slump and tried to strike an easy attitude as though he were accustomed to taking girls out. Which he isn't. <laughs> He waited till Harriet was within a few feet of him, then got up. Hello there, he said, trying to keep his voice from trembling. Are you Mr. Little? asked Stuart. I, I mean, asked Harriet. Yes, said Stuart, it's nice of you to come. Well, it was very good of you to ask me, replied Harriet. She was wearing a white sweater, a tweed skirt, short white wool socks and sneakers. Her hair was tied with a bright-colored handkerchief, and Stuart noticed that she carried a box of peppermints in her hand. Not at all. Glad to do it, said Stuart. I only wish we had better weather. Looks rather sticky, don't you think? Stuart was trying to make his voice sound as though he had an English accent. Hmm, maybe I should try to put one on. Harry looked at the sky and nodded. Oh well, she said. If it rains, it rains. Sure, repeated Stuart. If it rains, it rains. My canoe is a short distance up the store. May I help you over the rough places in the path? Stuart was a courteous mouse by nature, but Harriet said she didn't need any help. She was an active girl, and not at all inclined to stumble or fall. Stuart led the way to where he had hidden the canoe, and Harriet followed. But when they reached the spot where Stuart was horrified to discover that the canoe was not there, it had disappeared. Stuart's heart sank. He felt like crying. The canoe is gone, he groaned. Um... Then he began racing wildly up and down the bank, looking everywhere. Harriet joined in the search, and after a while they found the canoe. But it was a mess. Someone had been playing with it. A long piece of heavy string was tied to one end, the ballast rocks were gone, the pillow was gone, the backrest was gone, the spruce gum had come out of the seam, mud was all over the thi everything, and one of the paddles was all bent and twisted. It was just a mess. It looked just the way a birch bark canoe looks after some big boys are finished playing with it. Stuart was heartbroken. He did not know what to do. He sat down on a twig and buried his face in his hands. Oh, gee, he kept saying. Oh, gee, whiz.
"'What's the trouble?' asked Harriet. "'Miss Ames,' said Stuart in a trembling voice, "'I assure you I had everything beautifully arranged. "'Everything! And now look!' Harriet was for fix for was all for fixing the canoe up and going out on the river anyways, but Stuart couldn't stand that idea. It's no use, he said bitterly. It wouldn't be the same. The same as what? asked Harriet. The same way as the way it was going to be when I was thinking about it yesterday. I'm afraid a woman can't understand these things. Look at that string. It's tied on so tight I could never get it off. Well, suggested Harriet, couldn't we just let it hang over in the water and tra oh, along after us? Stuart looked at her in despair. Did you ever see an Indian paddling along some quiet, unspoiled river with a great big piece of rope daggering a st dragging astern? He asked. We could pretend we were fishing, said Harriet, who didn't realize that some people are fussy about boats. Hmm. Guess she is a modest person. I don't want to pretend I'm fishing, cried Stuart desperately. Besides, look at that mud! Look at it! He was screaming now. Harriet sat down on the twig beside Stuart. She offered him a peppermint, but he shook his head. Well, she said, it's starting to rain, and I guess I'd better be running along if you are not going to take me paddling in your canoe. I don't see why you have to sit here and soak. Would you like to come up to my house? After dinner, you could take me to the dance at the country club. It might cheer you up. No, thank you, replied Stuart. I don't know how to dance. Besides, I plan to make an early start in the morning. I'll probably be on the road at daybreak. Are you going to sleep out in all this rain? asked Harriet. Certainly, said Stuart. I'll crawl in under the canoe. Harriet shrugged her shoulders. Well, she said, goodbye, Mr. Little. Goodbye, Miss Ames, said Stuart. I'm sorry our evening on the river had to end like this. So am I, said Harriet. And she walked away along the wet path towards Tracy's Lane, leaving Stuart un alone with his broken dreams and his damaged canoe. And now we come to the last chapter. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 15. Heading north. Stuart slept under the canoe that night. He awakened at four o'clock to find the rain had stopped. The day would break clear. Already the birds were beginning to stir and make bright sounds in the branches overheard. Stuart never let a bird pass without looking to see if it was Margolo. At the edge of the town, he found a filling station and stopped to take on some gas. Five, please, said Stuart to the attendant. The man looked at the tiny automobile in amazement. Five what? he asked. Five drops, said Stuart. But the man shook his head and said that he couldn't sell such a small amount of gas. Why can't you? demanded Stuart. You need the money and I need the gas. Why can't we work something out between us? The filling station man went inside and came back with a medicine dropper. Stuart unscrewed the cap of the tank and the man put in five drops of gasoline. I hope he cleans it afterwards. <laughs> I've never done anything like this before, he said. Better look at the oil, too, said Stuart. After everything had been checked and the money had been paid, Stuart climbed in, started the engine, and drove out onto the highway. The sky was growing brighter, and a long... On the river, the mists of morning hung in the early light. The village was still asleep. Stuart's car purred along st smoothly. Stuart felt refreshed and glad to be on the move again. Half a mile out of town, the road forked. One road seemed to go oh, off towards the west. The other road continued north. Stuart drew up to the side of the northbound road and got out to look at the situation over. To his surprise, he discovered there was a man sitting on in the ditch, leaning against a signpost. The man wore spurs on his legs. He also wore a heavy leather belt, and Stuart realized that he must be a repairman for the telephone company. Good morning, said Stuart in a friendly voice. The repairman raised one hand to his head in a salute. Stuart sat down in the ditch beside him and breathed deeply of the fresh, sweet air. It's going to be a fine day, he observed. Yes, agreed the repairman. A fine day. I'm looking forward to climbing my poles. I'm sure you are. I wish you fair skies and a tight grip, said Stuart. By the way, do you ever see any birds at the tops of your poles? Yes, I see birds in great numbers, replied the repairman. 
Well, if you ever run across a bird named Demarglow, said Stuart, I'd appreciate it if you would drop me a line. Here's my card. Describe the bird, said the repairman, taking out a pad and pencil. Brown, said Stuart. Brown with a streak of yellow on her bosom. Know where she comes from? asked the man. She comes from the fields, once tall with wheat from pastures deep in fern and thistle. She comes from vales of Meadow Street, and she loves to whistle. And that's a rhyme. The repairman wrote it all down briefly. Fields, wheat... Pastures, fern and thistle, fails, meadow sweet, enjoys whistling. Then he put the pad back in his wallet and tucked Stuart's card away in his vet wallet. I'll keep my eyes open, he promised. Stuart thanked him. They sat for a while in silence. Then the man spoke. Which direction are you headed, he asked. North, said Stuart. North is nice, said the repairman. I always enjoyed go going north. Of course, southwest is a fine direction, too. Yes, I suppose it is, said Stuart thoughtfully. And there's east, continued the repairman. I once had an interesting experience on an easterly course. Do you want me to tell you all about it? Uh, no, thanks, said Stuart. The repairman seemed disappointed, but he kept right on talking. There's something about north, he said. Something that sets it apart from all other directions. A person who is heading north is not making any mistake, in my opinion. That's the way I look at it, said Stuart. I'd rather expect that from now on I shall be traveling north until the end of my days. Worse things than that could happen to a person, said the repairman. Yes, I know, answered Stuart. Following a broken telephone line north, I have come upon some wonderful places, 